We first met in 1972 when he lured in me into the strange cult called Divine Light Mission. After forcing me to paint three stories of a building in Wentworth Avenue, Sydney, he put me to work for no money, and this has been a recurring theme in our relationship, <laughs> publishing a monthly magazine for the faithful. It was called The Golden Age. In a moment of spiritual bliss, I had suggested calling it the golden shower, but for some reason David rejected this idea. He then went on to England and I fled to America. In the late 1970s, we met up again in Sydney and under the direction of a mad Frenchman, we put together a travel and restaurant guide called Le Guy de Bon Voyage. While David was responsible for production, I wrote glowingly about towns I'd never been to and drew pictures of lobsters to fill in gaps on the restaurant pages. It was not until 1986, when the echo started, that we renewed our friendship. I lived in Tasmania then and became the overseas correspondent. <laughs> Two years later, I moved to Byron Shire and David's partner, echo founder, the late Nicholas Shand, he was always late, took pity on me and gave me a job as a stringer at the astonishing rate of $8 an hour. Since then, David and I have been chained to the same wheel, laughing and cursing at its wayward revolutions. Necessity was the mother of strange invention in the early days, and David put down his dogged copy of the Thesaurus long enough to beat the Sydney Morning Herald to desktop publishing and newspaper on a network of Apple Macs held together by string and hope. It was a m remarkable act of technical proficiency from an intellectual demo whose opposable thumbs had almost withered away through lack of use. <laughs> As the Echo's publisher, David adheres to the leadership philosophy of the Tao Te Ching. If you keep your head down long enough in a chess game, the people will think they did it themselves. <laughs> he has pretty much let me do whatever I liked. His patience over the years has been extraordinary. If he gets angry at all, it's usually at a computer or George W. Bush rather than a person. <laughs> he is learned, eccentric, puckish, an endangered species which knows that syntax is not a levy on Paris Hilton. <laughs> it is my pleasure to work for him and to borrow extensively from his collection of Terry Pratchett novels. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge each of you to buy several copies of Between Dark and Dark as a salutary lesson to your children and friends as to what drugs can do to you and for you. If you spend up big, I might get a drink out of it from my boss or a couple of tabs of acid. And speaking of degradation, before I go, I would like to introduce the doyen of Chardonnay sipping Bolshe political commentators, a man who always files his copy on time, no matter the size of the hangover and we can expect a big one tomorrow, who will declare David's book officially open. Ladies and gentlemen, Mungo McCallum. <laughs>